Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our contract class. My name is Kevin Thatcher. For any of you that I've never met yet, I'm the owner of Independence Title and your host today. So I'd love to welcome most of you here today. Some of you came to us from the world famous Charles Ruttenberg Realty, and we thank them for being one of our sponsors today. For those of you that have never looked at their company, I encourage you to do so. Michelle is on here. So thank you, Michelle, for uh, getting most of your agents on. Thank and you very for much. Those, thank you. And for those of you that did not know, if you're not an agent of theirs, they're having a cool technology conference coming up here uh, on May 8th. So I encourage you to check them out, reach out to Michelle and learn a little bit more about what they do. So today we're going to be talking about the brand new changes that came out in November to the uh, Farbar contract. Uh, and we have Amanda, who is the state counsel for our underwriter, WFG who is a great partner of ours. You know, we did our classes with Sam. Uh, Sam is also a partner with WFG, so they're a great resource to support their agents. Uh, one of the things I like to tell people is years ago, I recorded a great video uh, that talks about how to properly fill out the real estate contract. So today we're gonna be talking about a lot of the changes in the contract, but I did wanna tell you, if you go to the website, smartcontractsfl.com, smartcontractsfl for florida.com, there is a 20 minute video there, which is me on camera talking about how to properly fill out. And I love saying properly, because like one of the common mistakes we see is people send contracts over and the seller's name is owner of record. And I always <laughs> say owner of record is not a person. So we like to teach agents, especially in a challenging market like uh, we are right now, obviously, where we know we're in a challenging market. You know, it's hard to get deals under contract. It becomes a bidding war. If I can teach you how to write a smarter contract, I guarantee you, you are going to one up someone else's offer and hopefully get that deal under contract. So again, I encourage you to watch this class that we're talking about today. It'll last about 45 minutes where we're gonna cover a lot of the new changes in the contract, but a lot of the things did not change. So I do encourage you to go back to that video, Smart Contracts FL, it's on our website, titlerate.com as well. You check it out, 20 minutes, it's a great class. I know I've done some uh, sponsorships at contract classes and even the people teaching the class watch that video and somehow learn something new, maybe something that we see as a title company. You know, we've done 25,000 closings over the last couple of uh, uh, almost 20 years now. Uh, so we encourage you to look at it because sometimes we see something that you don't. One of the other big things we see is which box do you check for title? The option isn't to check no box. You have to check one of the three boxes there is no, well, then it defaults. So, you know, a lot of little tips and tricks we go through. We want you to write a better contract. It's not only going to get your, your deal accepted uh, faster, it's going to beat someone else out, but most importantly, it's going to save you from an errors and omissions claim, which is our goal. We want to get in the deal together. We want to leave the deal together. So watch uh, any of those videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll check out all of the amazing trainings we did. We had a great Canva training, QR code training, wire fraud training. So we did tons of classes over the last couple of weeks. They are all recorded successfully and up on our YouTube channel. So I'm going to stop screen sharing and Amanda is going to screen share and take over. And if anyone has any comments, questions, put them in the chat and we'll be happy to get to them towards the end. So thank you all for joining us today and welcome Amanda. Hey, thanks, Kevin. Appreciate that. Um, as Kevin said, I am Amanda Hertham. I'm underwriting counsel with WFG National Title. I am a board certified attorney, and I'm happy to be here uh, discussing the changes to the Farber contracts um, that went into effect um, in October last year. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? We're all yeah. good? Okay, great. Um, and if you have any questions during, I'm happy to, if you want to unmute yourself and ask, you're not going to throw me off. This is a, an interactive class. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have during the seminar. So, all right, let's get started. So the first, first thing is, um, what is FARBAR and are you spelling it right? As I was preparing for this presentation, um, the question I, I received most was, uh, what does FAR bar stand for? And um, it, it stands for Florida Realtors um, and the Florida Bar. So um, it used to be referred to as the FAR 
bar contract. And now it's when they changed from the Florida Association of Realtors, they changed um, the acronym to, to FR instead of FAR. So <clears throat> the contract that we were discussing today is a carefully crafted product. Um, it's a collaboration between the Florida Realtors and the Florida Bar members. Um, there's a committee called, the, it, the acronym is REAL, R-R-E-I-L, but the, uh, the full name is the Residential Real Estate and Industry Liaison Committee. Um, they are a member of the Reptel, the Real Property Probate Trust Law Section of the Florida Bar. And there's also a Realtor Attorney Joint Committee, and they go line by line, um, word by word, making this uh, a, a all the, the most common negotiable aspects of a Florida residential real estate contract, um, they are making sure those items are all addressed to the satisfaction of realtors and attorneys to the best of their ability. Um, so I'm not providing fillable copies for you today, but they are available on the real property uh, uh, probate trust law section of the Florida bar, or you can get it from the Florida realtors um, a website. Um, you do have to be a member of each of those to, uh, to get the contracts. Um, but there are other services that do provide them. I'm just uh, not advertising for them today, so I'm not going to give them a, a shout out, um, especially because the Florida Bar and the Florida Association, Florida Realtors do, um, do put so much work into it. I would like to see them get the, the money from the contracts if you have to pay for them. So um, updates to these, these forms happen in every two to three years based on the meetings of the committees that I just discussed. Um, these updates reflect uh, changes in buying and selling trends, new laws, technology, finance rules, and sometimes even like social and climate issues. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some changes that were made in this situation relating to like the pandemic and some of the social unrest that was happening in the past few years. So recent past changes to the Farbar contract. Um, in 2017, the, the most notable um, change was the financing clause, and that was a huge undertaking. Um, the financing clause used to mention a uh, loan commitment, but uh, since the lending community really kind of dropped that language, um, they changed the, the loan commitment language with the term loan approval instead. They also changed the loan approval period from 30 days to 45 days um, since the TILA RESPA trade uh, rules were delaying approval um, and the, the new rules really required more time for the agents and for um, the, the buyers and sellers to get their uh, information back from the lenders. So they were all in um, in compliance with the trade rules. So just because I'm, I'm throwing out acronyms, I do want to define them for you. I just mentioned TILA, that's the Truth in Lending Act. RESPA is the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. And TRID is the TILA RESPA Integrated Disclosure, as we're all familiar with at this point. So another change that went into effect in 2017 was that written loan approval contingency was, was removed because technology has made it such that, uh, you know, we basically, we, we can get a verbal sometimes and, and that'll work uh, in, a, in a situation where you're waiting on, on loan approval. Um, also, uh, the extension of the closing time due to force majeure was extended from three days to seven days. Um, once insurance becomes available and closing uh, services are restored. So this was related to Hurricane Irma um, when it knocked out all of the, the power for several days for a lot of us. I, I know I was doing closings. I was an agent back at that time and I, I was doing closings with no air conditioning and no power and ended up having to, you know, to make copies and things I had to go to the realtor's office. So, um, so the, those things do happen and uh, thank goodness they gave us a little bit more time um, just in case those things do uh, come into play, come into play. Um, so if force major delays performance, uh, the parties are still bound by the contract for up to 30 days after the closing date. This was previously negotiable and the, um, the default term was 14 days. So again, this was the, the product of several hurricanes. I mentioned Irma, also Harvey and Maria. Um, we had the same issue in, in uh, certain places where the power was out for several days. 
Uh, the next change that they made in 2017 was that municipal lien search searches were added to the title evidence and insurance section to confirm that liens um, were able to be cleared from those searches, um, not just the, the stuff that came back on your commitment, your traditional um, pay off your mortgage and that sort of thing. This is so you get any code enforcement liens that are unrecorded. This is for um, unpaid water bills, that sort of thing. Uh, just a, a side note, permits are not included in lien searches, always. You can ask for them to be included, um, and they are not covered by title insurance. However, um, so the 2017 uh, contract change did add a requirement that when there are improvements to the property missing um, permits, the seller is required to provide anything they can do to help the buyer um, close out those permits. So that's like blueprints or plans or anything that, that you that the, the seller may have um, that would assist the buyer in closing out those permits. So these were the major changes. There were some other changes too, but, uh, but these were your big highlights. So in 2015, was the, that was the previous uh, um, change to the contract. The contract changed when the trade rules went into effect. And again, I'm pretty sure everybody's uh, used to trade rules at this point, you know, with the, the loan application timing and the, the uh, CD delivery dates and all that, um, using the CD and the Alta Settlement Statement instead of the HUD-1. Um, so the, those were, that was the biggest change in 2015. And again, the, the biggest change here um, was that the new CD came into play and it uh, changed how the um, cost of the loan policy was, was disclosed. Um, so that's why you have your difference between your CD, which was the federal form, and your ULTA settlement statement, which uh, you can show the actual costs in Florida. So true cost of the loan policy was the, the main um, uh, change because they wanted to make sure that everybody knew um, the true value of a, a loan policy. So um, we think about which contract of the version, which version of the contract we should use. Um, do we want to use the as is contract or the residential contract? Again, this isn't legal advice. This is just kind of my perspective. Um, so as is means that the property sold is in current condition, doesn't require any repairs or concessions from the seller. Um, it does still require disclosure from the seller of any potential issues um, of which they have knowledge, like boundary disputes, sinkholes, pest damage, um, uh, uh, termite infestation, that sort of thing. Um, so the buyer needs to be really careful when they obtain their inspections, when they are dealing with an as-is contract, um, surveys as well. So those, uh, those inspections and surveys should help to put the buyer's mind at ease that they were, they're buying something that they can handle in whatever uh, capacity. If they're, you know, if they know that it's a fixer upper, then great. If they, if they get those inspections back and they're surprised by moisture in the walls or something, you know, then, then they have the opportunity to back out of the contract. The traditional uh, residential contract allows for a little bit more negotiation up front regarding repairs and other defects. So um, I tended to use, and again, this isn't legal advice, this is just my, my opinion. Um, I tended to like uh, drafting a buyer's contract. Um, I, I would usually use a traditional residential contract because it gave me uh, more wiggle room in terms of uh, having the buyer be able to back out. Um, so remember the far farmer contracts are only to be used in residential circumstances because um, the, the farmer contract has things um, that are only specific to residential. And if you end up using them for commercial purposes, you're obligating your client to disclosures they may not have to make um, under a commercial uh, contract setting. Um, thinking about the Johnson v. Davies um, disclosures and, and things like that. Uh, so we'll find many of the same uh, changes in the 2021 um, uh, versions of the as is and as the residential, and there's just a few differences and, and we'll go through those at the end here. Starting with um, paragraph one in the as is contract, the first big change is the definition of personal property. 
So they're accommodating new technology that's arisen in the past few years. Um, the, the big thing is where they got rid of the intercom, added thermostats, doorbells, uh, television wall mounts, um, television mounting hardware. You're not necessarily going to want to leave your television, but you've taken all this time to install the mounting gear. So, um, and it's really, really becomes a fixture of the house at that point. So um, you don't want to remove that. I mean, you can always, again, negotiate it, but this is just included. Um, mailbox keys, um, storm protection items, and hardware were also uh, added. You'll notice here that uh, the um, washer and dryers are still not included. So make sure if you're, um, if your uh, client, oh, thank you, uh, Melissa, uh, Dr. Melissa Chester for the, the Johnson v. Davies, appreciate that. Um, and I see a, a note from uh, Stacey Mormon Carter, should you always use the right to inspect rider to both contracts? Um, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's probably um, a good idea. It, it is built into the contracts, but if you want extra protection, you can always use that rider. Sorry to, for the aside, but uh, I just wanted to answer those questions while I saw them pop up. Um, so again, washer and dryer not included. Uh, so make sure you wanna include those if your client wants the washer and dryer to be included. So I, I just have to say, like, the one thing that I was a little bit disappointed in um, was the intercom was going away, because that was like, just a staple of 90s life. And I have super 90s nostalgia. <laughs> I have to think about like, um, even 80s life, too. I think about like Ferris Bueller, they were playing the tricks on the on the um, principal, and he used his, his intercom. And, um, you know, if, if parents were having a, a party, they could buzz their kids upstairs to come down for the Super Bowl halftime show or something. And it, that just feels so, um, I know it's outdated, but I, I'm going to miss that, uh, you know, nostalgic uh, fun. Um, they, they did modernize it, though, with the smart thermostats and all that stuff and um, ring cameras and, and all that. Uh, I, I have to laugh. I, I really like the, the ring cameras. Uh, my coworkers um, have a tendency to show me their, uh, their wildlife from Lake Mary. They, they have bears and deer and everything they catch on their ring cameras. <laughs> so I, I always enjoy that. Um, because I, I'm also on the on the FLTA uh, cybersecurity um, committee, I have to just throw this in as a as a note. Um, quick security notice: the smart technology can be hacked, so be very very careful. You don't want anyone, um, you know, using your Furbo when you're uh, you're playing with your dog remotely uh, to um, to start hacking and listening to you and getting into your server and all that stuff. So just be careful. Uh, I had a question, if the washer and dryer was included on the MLS, is that sufficient for inclusion? No, it needs to actually be written into the contract. Next changes were to paragraph four regarding the closing date. Um, it's now it's now the closing paragraph instead of the, the uh, closing date paragraph. Um, so there there is an extension, I'm sorry. Uh, here, guys, sorry, I, I got tripped up. I was looking at the next slide. Um, the new paragraph four changes um, clarify that the closing is to occur when all of the closing funds are received by the closing agent and collected pursuant to standard S, which states collection or collected means any checks tendered or received, including deposits, have actually and finally have been become actually and finally collected and deposited in the account of the escrow agent or the closing agent. So it can't be just in your um, in your realtor's uh, uh, account. It has to be in the closing agent or the escrow agent, um, their, their escrow account. Um, closing and disbursement of funds and delivery of closing documents may be delayed by a closing agent until such accounts have been um, completed and collected in, in that uh, closing agent's account. So basically you just need the, the money in closing docs to consummate the, the transaction. Um, and, the, and again, the money needs to specifically go directly to the closing agent and not to the seller. So I'm not gonna get into this a whole lot, but this, this is a little bit why you'll see um, uh, title agents uh, and underwriters not able to close um, Bitcoin transactions because Basically, um, if if you were 
uh, sending Bitcoin funds, you'd basically be sending them directly to, to the seller. And then how do we as uh, closing agents and, and underwriters confirm that that's actually happened? I mean, we can, we can see um, wire instructions or transfers, but you know, we worry about um, the authenticity of, of the funds at that point. So uh, that's just my quick technology aside, but um, so again, make sure your funds and your uh, closing documents go to your uh, closing agent. Paragraph five is the extension of the closing date. Um, in the event that uh, closing funds are not available, um, then the, um, okay, hold it, sorry. Change, change is not, um, Changes has to do with the extension of the closing date due to not being in compliance with the CFPB rules um, where there's a fi financing contingency, that's box 8B. Um, CFPB requires that the CD is delivered three days prior to the, the loan consummation. So if the CD is not uh, received timely, but all other loan um, conditions are complete, then the closing date can be extended up to seven days to satisfy the CFPB rules. Um, the new components that are added in this paragraph are that the loan approval is obtained, lender underwriting is completed, and that the closing will result in an extension up to seven days if the CD is not uh, timely delivered. Next is paragraph 6A. This change was just um, mostly uh, grammatical cleanup and added a reference to writer T, which um, now requires the buyer and seller to agree upon a written lease. Um, it's now called the pre-occupancy agreement. Uh, it also requires them to agree on a possession date for the buyer, um, that the lease states that the buyer accepts the property in its existing condition, uh, relieving the seller of any repair, replacement, treatment, or remedy obligations, which they wouldn't have under the as is uh, contract anyway, but they would have it under the traditional um, contract. And then it requires the buyer to maintain, prop main the prop maintain the property and pay rent plus sales tax monthly in advance. It also allows for the termination of the contract if the parties cannot come to an agreement as to the terms of the lease and the buyer will be refunded their uh, deposit at that point. Paragraph 6B had changes. Uh, this is really to incorporate the seasonal rentals that are so, so prevalent these days, the short-term uh, vacation rentals as well. Um, I know that's a big thing in, in my area. I'm living in St. Pete right now, and um, I'm in a condo, and, and uh, several of our units have, um, have seasonal uh, tenants. So I know it's not just me. It's a, it's a big thing right now. Um, sellers are to provide the lease or rental agreement in writing um, to the buyer. And we can talk a little bit more about uh, the, the short-term vacation rentals when we get to the um, new rider that, that uh, is incorporated into um, the Farber contract. Next, we have paragraph seven. Um, change to paragraph seven is uh, that the contract is not assignable unless it's specifically intended to be. The default used to be that uh, the contract was assignable. So you'll want to make sure if you want it to be assignable, then you have to uh, to let um, the check the correct box. So again, just uh, thinking about paragraph. Eight, um, I wanna give you some, some terms since we're gonna be talking about them. The loan approval period is the time the buyer has to obtain loan approval. The default is 30 days. When we're talking about financing, we're talking about the terms upon which the buyer seeks to borrow money, such as the type of loan, interest rate, and term of loan. Um, appraisal uh, doesn't necessarily have to be an appraisal. It can be an, an alternative valuation satisfactory to the lender. So those are the, the key words, satisfactory to the lender. We've been, uh, th this change is, is um, really, they're kind of talking about like uh, drive-by appraisals and uh, BPOs and, and that sort of thing. So um, loan approval is uh, a loan that meets the financing and the appraisal terms. Um, there's a reference to Rider V in that loan approval as well. So you'll wanna just um, take a look at that Rider. 
paragraph, since this is related to what the definitions we just went through. So financing, um, they really just cleaned this paragraph up because it used to have a bunch of information about uh, a lender, but since this is a cash transaction with no financing contingency, you really don't need all the information about the lender. So it's, uh, it's not applicable to the cash transaction. Paragraph 8B, as we, we talked briefly uh, about definitions in this one. Um, two tasks must be completed during the loan approval period. And this isn't new, but the buyer must obtain approval for the financing as described in the paragraph. So either conventional FHA, VA, however it's, uh, it's described in this paragraph. But new to this paragraph um, and to this contract is that the buyer's lender must receive a satisfactory appraisal before the loan approval period expires. Um, again, we can, as we talked about the definition, start an alternative valuation of the property satisfactory to the lender can be provided instead of an appraisal. Um, so the reason they made these changes is because the uh, low appraisals were um, de derailing closings often and um, this expedites knowledge to the parties involved where whether a low appraisal will kill the deal. So that's why they, they're requiring the appraisal early or the valuation, depending on what you're using. So paragraph 8B1, this subsection clarifies the definition of loan approval. This now includes two components that a buyer is approved for financing as described in the contract and that the lender received the satisfactory appraisal of funds required. Um, I got a question from Stacey Mormon Carter. She's asking, since the appraisal portion is added in the loan approval contingency, how long does, does appraisal reports take to be given on average? Um, it really just depends on who you're talking to. It, it, sometimes you can get them in in a couple of days. Sometimes it takes a couple of weeks, just depending on how busy they are. Um, part of the change was due to the, the change in the market um, because there was so much volume, especially at the beginning of the pandemic um, with refis and uh, people trying to quickly snatch up homes that had a backyard and an office. So um, it really just depends. Now that the market's slowing down, I would guess just a day or two, but, uh, but I can, don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, I, I just got a, a question from Betty Garza. Um, when submitting an offer with an as-is contract, do you still need to include the appraisal rider? Um, you can, but the appraisal is still required uh, as per this contract, as long as you're getting um, getting financing. So it's part of the contract already. You can, if you want extra extra protection, extra language, then you can uh, use that appraisal writer. So if a if a buyer is approved for financing, but an appraisal is required and still pending for the purpose of the contract, it's not considered loan approval. Um, this section also now includes that loan approval requires uh, the buyer to sell another property. Um, uh, Rider V uh, entitled um, sale of buyer's property must be attached. So this is a mat matter of disclosure to all parties. So if, if you have a buyer um, where there's a contingency to sell their home, um, to purchase the, the new property, then you'll want to include that rider B. Um, yeah, uh, Stacy Mormon Carter asked, with FHA use the FHA rider and conventional use the appraisal rider? I, yes, that'll, that'll work um, in this situation with the new contracts. Next, we have changes to paragraph 8B2. Um, this section just really requires that the seller makes a written request to the buyer for status updates as to their mortgage loan application and the things that go along with that approval process. Um, the, the thing is, it, it has to be in writing at this point. 8B3, the changes um, require that the buyer notify the seller in writing of their loan approval prior to the loan approval period or this is the big change that if the buyer doesn't have approval but is confident that they will have approval, they can proceed with the closing. So if they're, they just know it's a formality or they're missing a form or something and, and they're just waiting on it, but they know they're gonna get approval, they can go ahead and continue. Uh, the change to 8 before uh, simplifies the language that if the buyer can't get loan approval within the time after really trying, then the buyer may terminate the contract. 
but yeah, you do have to exercise that good faith and diligent effort. They really have to try. Paragraph 8B5, uh, paragraph, um, state, this paragraph states now uh, that if the buyer gives written notice of termination prior to the expiration of the loan approval period, the buyer will get their deposit back and buyer and seller are released from the terms of the contract. If, however, the buyer doesn't provide timely notice to the seller, the parties do remain bound to the contract and the transaction is treated like a cash deal at that point. Paragraph 8B6, under this um, paragraph, if the buyer notifies the seller that they received financing or that they were confident that they were going to receive financing, but then they fail to close, the seller gets the deposit unless the seller is in default or the property conditions for the loan were not met. And that does not include an appraisal. The, it has to be um, some of the other property conditions uh, that need to be met. Changes to paragraph 9A, which are the costs to be paid by the seller. Um, the big change is that it delineates that FERPTA is a seller cost. Um, again, I like to define my acronyms as much as possible. Uh, FERPTA is the Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax Act. Um, I want you to remember it's not a penalty. It's just uh, something that you're um, collecting based on uh, foreign foreign person status. And it's how the, the government gets their money on a, on a property transaction with that foreign person. Paragraph 9C3, it, it stated that the buyer shall designate the closing agent. It was just kind of assumed previously, um, but now they're putting it in writing. So I wanna make a, just an aside about uh, paragraph 9C2, which is the, the buyer costs. So I know um, it's been a big problem uh, recently where if, um, if it's a cash deal, uh, buyers do not wanna pay for um, closing doc preparation or any sort of uh, title insurance. Um, so basically, the committees are still arguing over uh, the language that it, they want to change it, but they want to uh, make sure the language is suitable for both realtors and attorneys. And uh, so that's in the pipeline. I know um, several uh, underwriters and title agents have been sued at this point. And I haven't actually seen anybody uh, make a, a decision as to whether um, the buyer would be responsible for closing costs. Um, usually they, they end up settling. I haven't seen an actual, uh, case go through with that would set precedent. So just as a little aside. Paragraph 9D now requires that the uh, survey um, must be delivered at least five days prior to the closing date if the buyer wants one. Um, and this allows the surveyor to review the title commitment to see uh, if any easements or other recorded, um, uh, recorded encroachments need to be added to the survey. Um, and then also whether the buyer approves taking uh, subject to those, those items. So communicate with your surveyor. Um, they are very, very busy again with the, the way the market's going. I, now they're starting to get more into uh, commercial stuff and new, new construction. Um, so they're still, even though the, the refis have gone down and the, um, the residential uh, market has slowed just a little bit, they, the surveyors are still very busy. So um, just as an underwriting note, because I have to throw these things in there, when you're, um, when you're looking at your commitment and your survey, your policy and your deed, you wanna make sure that your legal descriptions all match. So paragraph 9F, there are some changes that uh, clarify who pays for special assessments and when. Um, we, we run into a lot of issues here where like agents are trying to prorate numbers in a settlement statement. They get stuck because they're um, not able to obtain a payoff on um, things like, like CDDs or things that are included on the tax roll, um, non-ad valorem uh, taxes on the, on the tax roll. So this change to the contract helps with that, especially when you only have a payoff amount for an installment payment, but not the entire lien. So basically the summation of this one is uh, the special assessments are not allowed to be prepaid in full, that are not allowed to be prepaid in full will be prorated and they won't be negotiated at this point. Um, I had a lot, when I was an agent, I had a lot of people say, buyers especially would say, well, I don't wanna pay for, um, 
uh, you know, a, a street light uh, installation that the um, that's on the tax roll, and now that ha that dispute has basically become moot because of the uh, changes to this um, paragraph. Um, so we talked about a little bit the changes from the 2017 uh, um, Farber contract, and we talked about that the seller has to provide any information they have on open permits. Um, so now this this uh, change to the paragraph um, really it, it refers to the um, Florida sec statute section 553.79. Um, and it was added uh, as it allows for additional methods to satisfy expired or open permits. So just wanna check, check out that statute and, and uh, um, that way you can talk to your seller about uh, helping the buyer close those permits um, and it gives them some alternative uh, methods of doing so. Property maintenance, um, change to paragraph 11. This just uh, directs you back to paragraph 9A where the seller, um, the seller costs were described. So it's regarding um, her, uh, property maintenance. So the seller has to maintain the property in paragraph 9A um, pursuant to that, uh, that portion of the contract. So paragraph 18F, they changed um, the location of the time is of the essence to make it more prominent. It was kind of buried in here um, after a couple of, of sentences. Um, it also clarifies where uh, the time zone where the property is located is where calendar calculations should be used. Um, it used to end at 5 p.m. The, the uh, time calculations used to end at 5 p.m. On, on the next day cutoff for periods ending uh, Saturday, Sunday, or a holiday. Um, this now it ended that um, so it goes all the way to midnight and I'm sure uh, if you're anything like me, you might um, go to bed with your work phone and maybe check it at three o'clock morning I, against all medical advice and, and all that but uh, but this is kind of uh, showing the new trend as to if we kind of work 24 hours a day. So change we talked a little bit about this because this was um, this was related to uh, the the Previous changes um, they made uh, for the hurricanes. Now we're talking about uh, force majeure is now considered um, uh, hurricanes, floods, and extreme weather, still all that stuff. But now it also um, covers uh, pandemics, epidemics, um, uh, acts of uh, uh, civil unrest, and um, government shutdowns. So um, the forces were kind of out of people's control and this just ex expands the coverage for um, force measure. So um, while this iteration of the contract doesn't change the time periods for dealing with force measure, it does con confirm that the extension um, be up to seven days after the event uh, prevents the closing. And if the event lasts for more than 30 days, like the government shutdown did, um, after the closing date, then either party can back out by delivering written notice to the other party, and the buyer does not lose their deposit. Fencing GTO. Um, so first, let me tell you what Fencing GTO is. It's a it's a way to keep um, terrorism related money out of the stream of revenue uh, by requiring entities purchasing properties in certain locations under certain circumstances to disclose who's involved in those entities. The um, changes to this paragraph emphasize that FinCEN GTO isn't optional. It was kind of uh, wishy-washy in the last uh, version, but this is now kind of uh, reinforcing that this is a really important thing. And it's required uh, that the closing agent um, properly reports the disclosures to the Department of Treasury. Uh, so just, just a little quick aside as to uh, what's covered under FinCEN. If it's a cash deal where you have uh, an entity, so an LLC or a corporation or a partnership, not a trust though, that's a specific um, exception. Um, if it's more than 300,000, they're, they're not getting a loan, um, then you need to, to uh, disclose in FinCEN. But this is, remember this is only applicable to Palm Beach County, Broward County, and Miami-Dade County. So if you're not um, working with a property in that area, you do not need to disclose FinCEN. 
if you're um, working with WFG, and this is more for any agents that are on the call, if you're working with WFG, um, you can send us an email and we will actually, you, you need to fill out a form, but we'll actually do the reporting for you if you, uh, if you send us the information. So kind of what we were talking about earlier with the, uh, with the um, stuff that's on the tax roll, uh, this paragraph relates to the, the same um, idea, the paragraph 9F issues regarding who pays special assessment. So this one um, confirms that CDD assessments and assessments imposed by other special districts will be prorated and uh, not negotiated. So a CDD being, uh, if you're not familiar, there it's a community development district, which is basically like a governmental um, homeowners association, more or less. So you do still have to get an estoppel and that sort of thing, make sure there are no special assessments. Um, and again, they're prorated, not negotiated now based on, on this paragraph. Okay, so this is kind of talking about the, the welcome to 2022 kind of. Um, the, the changes in this section uh, required notices are delivered in writing, um, which is awesome because we have so many ways to communicate these days. You think um, Facebook Messenger might work or TikTok or Snapchat. Nope, just kidding. Uh, it requires that, that a writing has to be delivered by mail, fax, personal delivery, or email. No text. I know that's a big one. Um, no WhatsApp, no Facebook Messenger, no TikTok, only mail, fax, personal de delivery, or email. And funny enough, I've noticed an uptick in people using faxes again. It's, I, I always kind of have to laugh at, uh, at faxes because it brings me back to the 80s. <laughs> that, that nostalgia is still fun. <laughs> All right, uh, so, so moving on to paragraph 19, which is your list of um, addenda and riders. So it re-indexes them uh, to conform with um, how they actually are now. The changes, the, the numbers and the letters and that sort of thing. So as I mentioned earlier, there are only a few um, changes to the actual residential contract that are different than um, the as-is changes, but all of the, the um, changes that to the as-is were carried through to the standard contract as well. So um, you have changes to the personal property, adding smart home devices, TV mounts, delete, deleting intercoms. Money must be collected by the closing agent and their closing docs must be delivered uh, for the closing to occur. Extension of the closing date to comply with CFPB rules if the CD isn't delivered timely, but all other loan requirements are completed. Um, adding the reference to the pre-closing occupancy um, by, the, by the buyer writer, um, adding that the seller must disclose in writing to uh, any short-term rentals or vacation rentals in addition to a traditional lease that must be delivered to the buyer. Um, default is now that the contract is not assignable. Um, all the new financing contingencies, you have to notify the buyer in writing. Um, uh, for the to the seller appraisal can, can be um, an alternative to an appraisal um, can close if the confident if you're confident that the loan will go through reminding everyone that the FERP does the seller's costs uh, in Dade County the buyer um, selects the closing agent if if 9c3 is marked um, survey must be delivered five days prior to the closing date uh, the special assessments um, will be prorated if the full payoff isn't available. Um, uh, sending you back to the seller pays for section for the property um, maintenance, all these things, uh, the force majeure updates, times of, of the essence, FinCEN being obligatory, um, the CDD and special assessments being prorated, uh, delivery um, conditions must be, as we just discussed, uh, by fax, email, personal delivery, um, or, or uh, in, by mail. Um, so the new changes to the residential contract are that um, watercraft lifts and related equipment are a part of the inspection and um, they should be in good working order. The, the watercraft lifts being anything related, even if it's, it's a jet ski or something small, it's not just technically a boat lift, it's any sort of watercraft lift. 
Um, and the other change is that sellers are no longer to uh, no longer required to get an estimate prior to making a repair, um, which are, that was in the old contract. They can just go ahead and make the repair if they're intending to um, to do so. So they don't have to wait on an on an estimate, present the estimate to the to the buyer. They just go ahead and make the change, make the improvement. So the other um, significant change to the residential contract is the removal of the counter offer rejection paragraph, since the seller really truly isn't required to reject the counter offer in writing. It's good practice, but they're, they're not required to do it. So new riders, um, I'm sorry, not changes to riders. We do have a couple of new riders, but this, this one's just a change. So this edit was made to make it clearer as to whether the association approval is required or isn't required on writer B. There are some other changes to writer B. This edit clarifies that the seller pays for anything either due in full or in installments prior to closing and that any installments due after closing are subject to negotiation. So that does give you, unlike the, uh, the paragraphs in the um, new, new contract itself, this does give you a little bit of uh, wiggle room in terms of negotiation for uh, homeowners association or, or community um, disclosure. So um, in Rider E, the acronym VA was actually defined. It was just uh, the acronym previously and uh, didn't discuss that it was the US Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, paragraph numbers in reference to certain inspections were deleted to avoid uh, future required changes if other portions of the contract or FHA VA provisions change paragraph numbers. So it just made it a little bit clearer. So you don't have to make any um, adjustments to things like uh, paragraph numbers. Rider T is the pre-closing occupancy by buyer. This just changes the term lease to, to pre-closing agreement. You can see where they've gone through and just made that update. Sale of, of buyer's property. This goes back to that paragraph eight financing contingency. The buyer must notify the seller that the sale is contingent on another property. We talked about that a little bit uh, when we were talking about paragraph eight. Uh, Rider W, the backup contract. This removes that 5 p.m. deadline since we are working 24 hours a day. This is a new rider. It's only for the as, I'm sorry, only for the residential contract and not for the as is. Um, it's a mold inspection uh, rider and it's um, basically allowing the uh, buyer at buyer's expense to um, obtain a mold inspection, uh, gives you um, time for, for uh, the inspection and um, the cost of remediation. Again, that's since it's asking for remediation, that's why it's not included in the as is. The other new rider, and we kind of talked about this a little bit, um, is the seasonal and vacation rentals after closing. Um, buyers and sellers can use this rider to agree whether or not the seller can enter into or renew short term rentals. And if so, whether the buyer um, must approve the terms of that if they carry over past closing. The seller also is required, required to uh, provide copies of the rental agreement uh, to, the, to the buyer in, prior to the closing. This is a new rider, the PACE um, disclosure, property assessed clean energy. These are used for the, basically loans used for um, solar panels or windows uh, with more efficiency. Um, uh, the seller must notify the, the buyer of any pace liens on the property. They should come up on your title report when you get it and should be in your commitment. Um, but just remember, they're not traditional mortgages, but they do need to be either satisfied or subordinated, depending on uh, what the pace lender is uh, will allow and what your um, first lender, if you have one on your purchase, uh, what they will accept. Um, just as an aside, if you uh, if you are curious about um, pace liens and you really want, it, it's a, a little bit skewed politically, um, but if you ever want to take a look at it, take a, a look at um, Last Week Tonight with John Oliver's Season 8, Episode 16. It's really informative about um, pace liens. Again, it, it is uh, quite anti-pace lien, but um, but uh, it's there and it's, it's informative one way or another. 
So um, just a real quick, again, this isn't uh, legal advice, just drafting tips that I find helpful. Uh, remember that these contracts are for residential um, properties only. Um, the contract does not require any buyer's closing costs at this point, um, uh, but it's a common courtesy because the, the uh, title company really is working for both sides. So, um, so even though they don't have that update in the, in the contract just yet, it's on its way, but um, it, we do kind of, uh, as, as title agents, uh, we do uh, hope that the buyers would be willing to pay just a little bit for our services. Um, you want to make sure that you draft in anything regarding um, additional terms. The, the section's there for, for a reason. Um, remember that who you're representing and draft to their best interest. Um, think about your contract version and the terms. Um, and don't forget the little things. If, if you have a question about something, make sure it's, it's uh, delineated in the contract because otherwise it's, it might get overlooked. And again, when in doubt, ask your client, broker, um, attorney, title agent, lender, other vendors, surveyor, um, all those people are, are willing to talk to you uh, or should be for the most part. Um, so if, if you have questions about what's going on with the closing, then um, talk to people. So um, again, uh, just, just think about your escrow deposit, uh, you know, um, it needs to go to the to the title company and be uh, confirmed by them prior to closing. That's pretty much all I've got for you. Thank you so much for attending. And uh, um, if you do have a Florida Bar um, number, then I do have CLE credit for you. The number is on the screen. Um, I did not apply for uh, for. DFS CE credits. Um, as I, I was told, this is mostly a realtor class and I, I don't have authority to uh, present for realtors at this time. I'm working on it, but uh, I haven't received my approval just yet. Um, and uh, since most uh, um, title agents were not going to be on the call, then I, I didn't apply for the um, CE um, uh, number on this one. Um, I was just asked, oh, I have, um, does, a, does a PACE lien have to be satisfied prior to the transfer of a property? It either needs to be satisfied or it needs to be subordinated, correct? Not, not necessarily prior to, but you just have to get a, uh, at closing, you can do it. So thank you to everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to stay on for a few minutes and, and discuss. Yeah, so I have a couple of questions that sure. normally come up that I just, it'll be good to hear it from you as well. Sure. Uh, sometimes when I tell them, they think I'm crazy. So uh, <laughs> the first one, the so the old contract before they changed yes. the, the cash clause. If you have time to play, Romy, that's a working for a story. They're not speaking. So the, Yo, cash, the cash portion they changed. So in this new contract, it used to say the old one that the buyer may still obtain a loan, right. although it's not contingent. So in this contract, if it's selected as cash, so a lot of our investors that are on here, are they still legally allowed to get a loan? Are they still legally allowed to get a loan? No, because I mean, they, they would have to change the, the terms of the contract. You'd have to, to do an addendum for the contracts allowing- but if it's not that. contingent upon, I guess is a question they ask a lot. Like if they decide to get a loan, even though it's not contingent, can they close with a loan? Let's say- oh, yeah, money yeah that's, that's no problem. Yeah, yeah, so that, cause it's a question we get asked a lot cause it used to say that, that it's not contingent upon, but they may still obtain a loan Right. Now this contract, they removed that whole paragraph and just said it's either cash or not cash. Right. But if they decide to get a loan and, and you present all the uh, the correct information and say, hey, I got a loan, I'm approved, everything looks good, then yeah, that, that's no problem. Okay. So second one, I just like do like to point out again for the investors that are on here, where she talked about the assignment clause that it did change. So the contract is no longer defaulted to being able to be assigned. So a lot of the investors on here, make sure you are checking that assignment box that is is allowed to be assigned. Otherwise, uh, you know, whether you close with us or someone else, it could be challenged and you will not be able to assign it. Um, one of the questions we get now is because the contract used to say 5 p.m. for time. Now it no longer says 5 p.m. So is the default just midnight? 11.59 p.m. Yeah. 11:59. So uh, again, for for a lot of the investors, you know, sometimes time crunch comes at five o'clock, and they're like, "Wire's not in the escrow account." Um, so just be careful with the time frame. Although the contract extends to 11:59, you want to be careful um, because if your funds need to be in, 
you know, be very careful with that. But for delivery of documents, if the money's there, that could actually save some of the investors where if delivery is not there by 5 p.m. to fund, as long as they get the documents to the title agent in time, uh, it technically the closing date extends till 11.59, uh, no longer 5 p.m. And then the last one that, that I get asked all the time is about the escrow deposit. And let's just say the buyer doesn't uh, gets denied financing and puts the seller on notice, but the seller decides to challenge them. Is it an automatic release of deposit or can the seller still challenge it and it would have to go to court or mediation? Uh, I'm sorry, was it repeat the question? What was so the, if the let's part? just say there's, there's the loan contingency and the buyer decides to cancel within the loan contingency, does the contract act as an automatic release or do they still have to get the seller's signature in order to release the deposit? Best practice is still to get a signature from from either party, but I I believe that you could argue that the contract allows for automatic release at that point if they're backing out, if the buyer's backing out. That that um that paragraph is a little bit uh, unclear, but I believe that you're okay uh, to to disperse at that point. Right. And Again, I think part of it may be for the changes that that come up next time. You know, like with the whole lien search issue it caused where the lien search, you know, was now included in the inspection period. Yeah. And there's no way a title company is going to get the, uh, you know, sometimes these lien searches are three, four weeks. So there's no way to get them back in time. So now you have to exclude it from the inspection period. And I remember I went to the person that helped draft the contract, one of the attorneys, and he said, you're absolutely right. They drafted the contract to favor the seller as opposed to the transaction. Um, so again, it's just smart to watch our other video, the smart contracts video, learn about how to properly fill out the contract and learn how to stick within the contingencies of the contract. So you don't run into a jam where, you know, your buyer potentially loses their deposit because with this loan approval one, that was a big one that after 30 days, some agents didn't realize that it automatically waived the financing and they've, they've had to reimburse buyers for losing deposits for their mistake of, of holding to that uh, time. Period. Yeah, everything is dry, but that's like, you got that's why you got to be along with it, you know? And that's it. That's all I have. Anyone else have any questions? I just answered a couple in the chat, so. Uh... Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Kevin. We truly appreciate um, all of this education. Thank you. Appreciate you putting it on. And I just have to say, my mom is a Ruttenberg realtor, so uh, so we appreciate you as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone, have a great day. We will uh, try and get this recording up as soon as possible.